Welcome good people, my name is Joel Collier and today we're going to talk about what is invariance testing and why we need to do it and ultimately why it's so important with survey research. So before we kind of get into that, let's talk a little bit about just to, uh, generally about what is invariance testing before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts. So invariance testing really takes place in a measurement model analysis. Uh, typically in a confirmatory factor analysis is where you see measurement uh, measurement invariance taking place and invariance is really an assessment of multiple groups so it's looking across groups to see if there's equivalence or if there's variance there and in essence an invariance test what it does is really trying to establish that your measurement of your items or your indicators are equivalent across the group so in essence are you asking the exact same thing across the groups to so the are the items or the indicators that you're using for let's say a survey do those questions mean the same thing really across the groups and so from a perspective of invariance what you want to do is you really want to show invariance across the group saying that you know I asked this question across both groups and really both of them interpret the question the exact same way uh, and so the meaning itself is, is similar across the group. So you're really looking for kind of non-significance uh, in this test. So to give you an example of uh, why we use this, um, so let's take an example from education and let's say we were trying to uh, survey teachers and we we had this original scale item and it was about support and the scale item was I feel supported in my school but we needed to adapt this scale item to apply to let's say teachers cohort we're also going to apply it to or adapt it to their boss too and so the scale item maybe now adapted well I feel supported by my fellow teachers in my school and the adaption for my boss maybe I feel supported by my boss in my school well those two questions can mean very different things depending on those two different groups too because I feel supported by my boss maybe um, he, he pays me well or he gives me time off when I need it or she gives me time off where I feel supported by my fellow teachers in school maybe they'll answer any questions I have uh, when they uh, are raised and so the idea of support itself may have very different meanings uh, the words are similarly worded across the two groups but they actually mean different things and so we'd probably need to do an invariance test another example of this would be in business and let's say the scale item really doesn't even change itself right so this is a, a from a, a, uh, a retail setting specifically a restaurant and they were talking about how surprised people were with the service you know and the scale item was I was surprised by the service experience well if you're a first-time customer that surprise might be like things were really good or it was exciting you know or everything was you know really bubbly and atmospheric there where with repeat customers I was really surprised by the experience meaning that well it was really dull this time or the, ex the experience was bad it's always been great in the past but I was surprised this time and so the idea uh, of the scale item itself may mean really two different things because the groups themselves may interpret it very differently so you're trying to assess is the meaning of the item still the same other ones that you'll see that's kind of used with possible groups for invariance testing is sometimes the, uh, especially reviewers will ask that you do an invariance test because of the medium of how you got the data so let's say you got some of the data via online surveys, some of the data from pen and pencil or paper, uh, um, pen, and pen, uh, pen and paper, and they're thinking, well, there may be differences in those responses because of the medium itself of how it was collected. There may be differences there. And so they say, well, we really want you to do invariance tests just to show that those are the same. Some of it even may be demographics. If you believe that fundamentally these you know demographics are different so to give an example of this you can say well are, are males and females the same well in certain instances they they're exactly the same but in others they're different in how they think sometimes so if you're talking about with small boys and small girls and you're asking them about um, their attitudes toward play well play may mean for boys to go outside and you know tackle each other 
And for girls, it might mean to sit down and free draw or vice versa uh, on those. And so in those instances, the idea of play itself may be fundamentally different across genders. Uh, and they will say, well, you really need to probably do an invariance test on this. Now, if there were the exact same question, it was like ease of use, like how easy is it to use this technology? You know, both probably your genders are, I mean, are, are going to probably interpret that the exact same way. And there's really no sense of doing an invariance test if that's the case. It's really only when they're fundamentally different in how they interpret something. Uh, some of it may be an item of focus. Uh, so, for instance, uh, using kind of another example from business, if it was a retail setting and you're asking them about their experience, if, you know, in a retail setting, and it may be, you know, how was your experience when um, you were buying this product for yourself versus you're buying this product as a gift for somebody else? And if you were looking at, like, for instance, something like imagination even in the retail experiences, but I could imagine myself wearing this, or I could imagine the person I bought this for wearing it. Well, those are kind of different, and so they may say, well, you really need to do an invariance test across those because you've changed the wording, and it it's kind of slightly different now in its meaning just to make sure that it means the exact same thing across ultimately if you have to adapt your scale items across groups um, and you're going to do a test across those then you really probably are going to need to do kind of an invariance test so there are really five types of invariance tests that you commonly see uh, being required and those are configurable invariance, metric, scalar, factor variance invariance, and then error variance invariance. And so configurable invariance is probably the easiest to establish and error variance invariance is probably the most hardest to establish too. So I'm going to kind of talk specifically more about the ones that you're going to see commonly asked for uh, by reviewers and journal articles uh, kind of moving forward. So configural invariance, sometimes they refer to this as establishing structural invariance, is what you're trying to do is to establish in your confirmatory factor analysis model fit, um, but model fit across the groups so that the actual structure of the model itself as it's compared to the covariance matrix or the data, if you will, is still you know, good, um, adequately fitting. Because if you can't get a good model fit across the two groups then at that standpoint like you've got huge issues um, and to establish kind of configurable invariance you're going to examine these kind of fit indices uh, the goodness of fit indices sometimes the badness of fit indices like the root mean square error of approximation uh, and in looking at chi-square and establishing does this um, uh, measurement model fit the data across the two groups. If it does, then it indicates that you've initially passed kind of configurable invariance and can kind of move on to the next one, which is metric invariance. Now, metric invariance is the one where you're going to see, especially a lot of reviewers and journal articles and editors, really keying in on because this one is one they're really specifically saying you've got to establish this. And metric invariance, sometimes called metric unit unit invariance is does these items that you use to measure this construct are they kind of equivalent across the groups in their meaning and the way that we do this is by assessing or uh, examining the factor loadings uh, of the constructs across the two groups uh, and how this is done is you're going to run a chi-square difference test and you're going to run a confirmatory factor analysis where the two groups are able to initially just they're unconstrained they're free to estimate across either both of the groups and then you're going to run a separate confirmatory factor analysis where you're going to constrain the factor loadings across the two groups to be equal uh, and then by looking at the chi-square of those kind of two models, the unconstrained and the constrained model, you're looking at the difference between those two in chi-square and seeing if it's significantly different. If it is, then you've got variance. If it's non-significant, then you've established metric invariance. Uh, the term is actually full metric invariance if all of the factor loadings are constrained uh, versus the unconstrained model. That is full metric invariance. And so in essence, you want non-significance on this because it says that my items do not differ across groups in its meaning. 
well, what if I get significance in that invariance test? Am I just kind of dead in the water? No. Uh, you can establish what's called partial metric invariance. So Barbara Byrne uh, and her colleagues kind of went through this whole process talking about uh, partial metric invariance, which is the idea, like sometimes full metric invariance is just extremely difficult to find depending on the complexity of the model. But instead of saying, well, you're just, you know, done, retreat back, they said you can establish partial metric invariance and still show kind of invariance that should not bias your results moving forward. And partial metric invariance is where at least two factor loadings in each construct is constrained to be equal uh, across the groups. So in essence, what you're doing is, is within a construct, you know, for instance, in this example right here, there's three indicators. Uh, so I would let one of them freely estimate across the groups, and I would only constrain two of the three uh, as my test. So the first model would be completely unconstrained, and then the second model would be the constrained model where only two of these three would be um, constrained, and we're looking at that chi-squared difference across again to see if we can get non-significance. Um, so in essence, do I have to free uh, one in every construct? Let's say I got ten constructs. Do I have to free one in each one? No. So if you know if there's one construct that seems to be especially problematic, then just free that item in that one uh, construct, you know, making sure the others, others still have at least two, at a very minimum, two others constrained within that construct, and then run your analysis again to kind of establish that non-significance saying that your metric or your measures are invariant across the groups. The other invariance tests, um, are very similar to metric invariance tests except they're constraining just more than just factor loadings. So scalar invariance, what it does is it constrains factor loadings but also intercepts. So you have the unconstrained model really compared to a constrained model that is constrained with all the factor loadings and also the intercepts. You can also establish partial scalar invariance if you can't establish full, so that's an option too. And then you have factor variance and variance, which is they're only con they're constraining not only factor loadings but covariances, variances, you know, across the groups. And then the last one, error variance and variance, constrains factor loadings, covariances, variances, and even error terms. I'll tell you that one's very difficult to establish non-significance uh, in that invariance test. More times than not, what I would say I see prominently is. Uh, reviewers want to see configura configurable invariance and they want to see uh, metric invariance. Sometimes they'll also want to see scalar invariance. Once you establish those three invariances too, they're at the point where they're like, all right, you're good. You're showing invariance in that. Let's just move on. Uh, very rarely have I had to show kind of factor variance invariance or even error variance invariance. So if you're looking for more information on how to actually run invariance testing in AMOS, Structural Equation Modeling profit, uh, Program, uh, I would encourage you to check out my book, Applied Structural Equation Modeling Using AMOS. It gives more of a step-by-step -step, um, process of how to do this in AMOS and where the results are and how to kind of report it and those things that you're really kind of concerned with uh, when you're doing testing in, um, you know, kind of, academic research and as always uh, if you saw value in this video I would ask that you uh, like and subscribe um, and I hope you have a good week good people